Well, here at the All Council, I'm now joined by David Sturt, who is the Managing Director of Azinam, which, uh, of course, your main focus is in Namibia. Now, many people might be thinking, hang on, that's a bit risky, because an awful lot of dry wells have been, have, have been developed uh, in, in Namibia. So why are you there? Well, um, very good question. There's a, normally in exploration it takes a series of wells to uncover the petroleum system and find exactly the right ingredients to where the accumulation is. In terms of Namibia, there's been, in essence, 15 exploration wells in four different sub-basins. There's been one discovery, the Kudu gas field, with the first well. Uh, what is interesting now is that uh, the recent phase of drilling in 2013 and 14, it led to the first oil being recovered to surface in the Wolvis Basin by HRT. And so, although there's been a series of wells drilled, the more recent wells have proven up all the elements that are important to get a, a large accumulation. You have a proven source, you have a seal, you have a reservoir, and you've got the oil to surface. So, we strongly believe that uh, now is a time for Namibia because you have good quality seismic data, you have the ability to, to drill in deeper water, and you have uh, all the ingredients for a working petroleum system. Now, coupled with the subsurface, the other unique thing about Namibia is the operational and fiscal environment. If you look at sub-Saharan Africa, Namibia's got one of the best fiscal regimes in the region. It's a very stable country. It's had a long period of uh, regulatory regime, not just in the oil industry, but in mining as well since the turn of the last century. It's very supportive. It's operationally easy to operate in. It's got one of the best deep water ports in Africa, in Wolvis Bay. So it's got all the right ingredients, not just subsurface, but on the surface as well. And I suppose, uh, I mean, and that's great, the infrastructure's there and, and, and the economic yeah. and uh, technical infrastructure's there. But I, I suppose maybe the, a, a, a better way of looking at it is to say, look, well, there have been dry wells. The problem is they've been drilling in the wrong place. Uh, and you've now got a lot of data over a very large area. Uh, is that giving you a different picture? Is it a question of you're actually using the data more intelligently yeah. than people may have done in the past? Well, I don't appear to be arrogant, but the more acreage you have, obviously the more proprietary and non-proprietary data you, you, you actually accumulate over time. We built our position up over four years. We're now, as you say, one of the largest acreage holders. We've got our footprint on the ground is 70, 000, nearly 70,000 square kilometres. Uh, that gives us a, a unique perspective of the regional geology, which we then translate into a block-specific uh, prospectivity analysis. There was a very good comment at the conference in London recently by Paul Daly, uh, Cosmos, uh, and he said, whenever you go into basin, make sure your footprint is large enough to take account of the limitations of your knowledge and point of entry. So, as you say, we clearly have managed to leverage our data base to uh, improve our understanding of, of the basin. I think the proof is that when we first went into Namibia, you know, people say 15 dry wells. It was, it was not uh, on the map of most uh, larger international EMP companies. With approving the petroleum system in 2013, on the back of that you had Tullo coming into the Wolves Basin, firstly farming into Pan Continental's acreage, then farming into our acreage, Murphy OMV coming to Ludwig's Basin, and Shell coming into the Orange Basin. So what you see is a is a kind of reawakening of the interest in Namibia by the larger EMP companies. Mm. But I mean, are you in a position though? Are you too small to be able to a to fund the kind of uh, research and, and that, you, that you need to do into that? Um, and are you possibly therefore going to lose out to the big players who are now moving in? Well, uh, I don't think so. I mean, Azanam obviously is a big player within Namibia. But Azanam is part of the greater Seacrest family. We have uh, six regional EMP players in Brazil, uh, North Ireland, UK, Norway, Indonesia. And we're lucky because Seacrest Capital, which is our, our, our funder, is very well financed. So whereas a lot of players are actually potentially suffering because of the, the capital market situation and also the low oil price, we're actually seeing this as a great opportunity. So the simple answer is, we are not capital constrained. We're fully funded through our program at the moment. We're prepared to allocate capital to drilling. So we're not going to be squeezed out like some of the other smaller players who are suffering because of the capital market situation at the moment. Mm. And so, so you've got, you've got Seacrest, the, the backing there, the, the benefits of, of scale. Uh, but also you've got um, partners in a lot of these offshore licenses too. Tell me about you know, how, how useful is that? What do they bring to the table? We have a variety of partnerships. Uh, we're in, uh, in we are partnerships with Eco Atlantic Oil and Gas, 
uh, with uh, Mule and Prom, who are obviously based here in, in Paris, uh, and with Chariot Oil and Gas, and obviously recently with, with Tullo. It get, all the partnerships have different dynamics and bring more to the table. We, we have a very strong relationship with Tullo, both on a regional and a prospect-specific understanding. They appreciate our footprint, our regional knowledge, and we appreciate their strengths as well. Um, Echo Atlantic, a relatively small uh, Canadian player, but big in Namibia, they bring a lot of uh, local um, relationships, which is, is important to us. Mule & Pom, obviously a, a big French company. So each partnership has a dynamic which is beneficial to, to our company. Um, obviously now, as we an operator ourselves in Namibia, it gives us much more information flow, control and uh, stronger relationships with all the stakeholders like the MME, which is the Ministry of Mines and Energy, Namco, etc. in country. Yeah. So what are the next steps for you? What goes next and is, are those steps dependent on the oil price because it's, it's been languishing, it's recovered, but you know, is that making you hold back a little bit or are you still going ahead for the long term? Well, very interesting. We've, spent, we've taken a long term view in Namibia from 2011. We continually reevaluate our subsurface understanding as we acquire more data. We interrogate our models. We use that then to drive the, 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 the business model going forward. We've done several acquisitions over the last two years. We've, we've increased our equity interests, we've take, assumed operatorships. And the actual oil price at the moment for us is an opportunity, not a constraint. So, whereas some of our other partners may be suffering, it gives us strength to say, well, listen, we can step up, take more interest and pay more of the programme. And, you know, the last deal we concluded was actually December last year when the oil price was low. So it's more of an opportunity for us, and, and our history shows that. In terms of where we are going forward, um, we're looking at new deals all the time in Namibia. Uh, we have a very um, rigorous um, kind of specifications for what we, what we need. But I anticipate that our footprint, either in equity or, or, or size, will change, will evolve. Right. Okay. David Sturt, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you.